Next, our rock section, of which there are three. Oh, four out. Yeah, four albums. Huh. <laughs> so first, Katie Tunstall. Katie Tunstall. I have been a pretty big fan of for quite a while. And I got into her mostly around the time she released her second album, Dressing Fantastic, back in 2007. I think I've seen her live four times now, so... <laughs> yeah, it's probably more than most bands, so yeah. I'm a pretty big fan of her. Yeah, uh, I've, be, I've been sort of dipping in, in and out of her music. I had to very carefully phrase that otherwise. <laughs> I mean, I would, but... <laughs> Mm, just let's say that for later on, so everyone remembers. Hmm. Which one everyone remembers you saying that? This is just yeah, uploaded directly to the internet. But anyway, um, I've listened to her music now and again. Really enjoyed it. I actually remember way, way back. It might have been two thousand and five, two thousand and six. Uh, when she was on later with Jules Holland. Yeah, first album, two thousand five. So that's probably about the side. Oh, then it would have been 2005, because she was performing solo, and she was doing the whole, um, you know, when some artists, when they're performing solo, they'll create beats and various sounds and record them and overlay them. She was doing all that sort of thing, and I distinctly remember her performing Black Horse and the Cherry Tree, and it was amazing to watch how, you know, how at home she was with performing this song and crafting the music around it. But she literally just started at that point, at least, at least commercially at least. I mean, fun fact is that, if I'm correct, when I saw her at Glastonbury one year, she actually forgot the lyrics of that. <laughs> <laughs> like, even though she's been performing it for like five years. But, uh, people make mistakes. Uh, Devin Townsend has managed to forget the lyrics at times. I think the best thing I've seen though was seeing Coldplay one year at Glastonbury and he forgot the lyrics on the main stage headlining. <laughs> He's gonna wait. Oh, shit! I don't know what to say. Um, there you go. <laughs> I'm not a particularly big fan of Coldplay, but that was pretty, a pretty amusing moment. Hmm. Thing is, uh, even though I'm not a fan of certain bands like James Blunt, I couldn't stand a song he's ever done. But I can at least appreciate the sense of humour that he has about himself. Yeah, that's good. Anyway, back to the album, I guess. Well, we're talking about other albums again. Because we get distracted easily. <laughs> yeah, I really enjoyed this album, actually. Um, it might, I will actually only say it might be my favourite album of hers, at least on first listen, since her first one. I wouldn't be able to comment because, as I say, I've only really listened to individual tracks. This is the first time I've ever listened to a full album. Um, I really enjoyed it. I wouldn't say, you know, it's absolutely amazing, but it's certainly an album I would go back to. Hmm, I'd agree with that. Just, I mean, I said it wasn't, you know, mind-blowingly incredible or anything, but it was a solid album, and I will probably go and buy it, because I've been meaning to anyway, and now I've actually heard it, like, yeah, this is good, I'm going to go buy it. Yeah. I, I would say the one key detractor would be track two, Turn the Light On, because that, for me, it felt very bland. Um, it kind of felt a bit lyrically barren. Mm, I guess I can say that. I mean, also... It's probably the least interesting musically on the album as well. Yeah. It, it just sounded like generic pop, really. Uh, especially when you sandwich it between sort of like hard girls and maybe it's a good thing. But hey, well, most albums do have like a weak song here and there. Mm. Uh, as far as I can tell, from at least what I recall listening to it in full, that's the only song that really stood out as being you know, not on par with the rest. So. Yeah. But it's a very solid album. Yeah. Uh, one thing that struck me as kind of strange is how um, everything has its shape. Uh, it kind of sounded like an ABBA track. <laughs> yeah. I was sort of like, hang on, did, did Brian and Bjorn write this or something? <laughs> or whatever their names are. I think it's Brian and Bjorn. I know but the two Bs in ABBA stand for their names. So. But yeah, I definitely enjoyed this album. Um... I'd say it's one of those cases of a lot of the albums we've covered thus far, with the exception of the two electronical albums, I'd sort of I'd take out the odd ones that I don't enjoy and then keep the rest. 
as well. Because as it stands, none of these are none of the other albums are really conceptual albums. So it's not like it would detract from the effect of the album if you didn't have one of them. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. I like some of the stuff we'll be doing later. Yeah. Uh, overall, uh, Kin. I keep forgetting to say the names of some of these albums, uh, but Kin, I'd give a three out of five. I'd probably give it a three point five. Might grow on me over time, but a three point five out of first lesson at least. Yeah, same. Next up, War Paint with Heads Up. Uh, I wasn't really sure what to expect of this, because I've been following Warpaint since their first EP. Mm -hmm. uh, this is our third album now, and most of the albums they've released have been a bit different to the previous one each time. Right. We're kind of going from experimental kind of shoegazy style stuff to kind of more poppy style, and then back to here kind of dream pop, I guess, probably better way to describe it, and that isn't really that descriptive of a genre. Mm -hmm. But people know what you mean when you say dream pop, apparently. Apparently, I wouldn't know. <laughs> We've still got kind of like shoegazy kind of effect going on. It's always been there, but it's kind of just more prevalent in some songs or some releases than others. For me, it just came across as sort of a jazz folk rock kind of thing. Um, definitely a good album to listen to if you just need to relax. Mm, I'd agree with that. Uh, I was actually lying in bed and sort of listening to it, I was able to just... As opposed to making me drift off, it was able to make me sort of go, okay, I'm coming around to being awake. As opposed to some some of the later albums where it's sort of like, okay, I'm awake now! <laughs> I think I know exactly which one you want about. <laughs> but yeah, this is okay, different to the last thing to have done, but I really like it. Yeah, uh, I mean, this is the first album of that. I mean, I don't think I've listened to any War Paint before now. No, I've only been around since late 2009, if I'm roughly. So, it was at least six, seven years or so. But to be fair, the amount of bands that have been around for ages and I've only recently gotten into them is kind of staggering. <laughs> That's like one band that I saw supporting Lacuna Coil back in 2004, which I think still haven't released an album. It's whether they're still touring. <laughs> I mean, let's face it. How long have Tool been around for, and I've only just gotten into them? At least a couple of decades? I'd be inclined to say they're like 93 or something? I'll try this. Something like that. Um, 1990. Yeah. So they've been around for. They're almost as old as us. Yeah. You've only just heard them this year. <laughs> well, it's not that I only just heard them, it's that I only just got into them. Mm. Because. I, I don't know what it is, but I was never able to get into them initially. Well, it's been coming in weird songs. Mm. They've got some very experimental stuff in there. Yeah. But anyway, back to War Paint. Um, I'm really not sure what really stands out to me as the best song on the track on the album because this actually feels a bit more like a conceptual album. Mm. I think what it does actually make me think of a bit is I don't know, some of the songs, I mean, The Stool is probably the best example. Mm -hmm. It kind of makes me think of a cross between The Cure and Garbage. Yeah, I can hear that. Because, yeah, it, was, it was, seemed to be a pretty obvious influence in both of them, at least in some context. Mm. And being a fan of both those bands, that's probably why I like these guys. Well, girls, because they're all female, but... Eh, I use guys as a fairly generic... It's a pretty non-gender term. Let's not get into gender politics right now, that's the worst place we can go. Mm. Now, the one song title that really puzzles me, Dre, or Dre, or however it's meant to be pronounced... I'm assuming Dre? I I don't know. It's not the first time they've had weird titles. But I mean, I just looked it up and it's sort of like, the only result I get is for Dr. Dre. <laughs> yeah. And the California Bureau of Real Estate. <laughs> what? You know, the last album, for example, had Disco Slash Slash Very. I don't think it's Disco Very. Disco Very, also Discovery. <laughs> was this a song called Biggie, Tease, CC? I don't know what that means. Cryptic bullshit. We just have a meaning, but I don't know what it is. But uh, yeah, Dre specifically is very kind of ethereal. That's probably the best word to remember. Mm -hmm. It kind of reminds me of something, but I can't think what. Yeah, I I mean, I remember when I was properly coming around, it was during Dre, and it was sort of a, 
Ah, okay. I think what it does kind of make me think of a little bit is um, what would happen if you, you know, did a synthwave song but with real instruments? Mm. <laughs> if you took like, a guitar and some drums and stuff and then played a synthwave tune. <laughs> well, then you think of synth sort of. Yeah. That's, I think actually Dre is probably one of the best examples of what some of the earlier stuff sounds like as well. Yeah. So, no, with more. It sounds, I guess it sounds kind of like you're underwater, I guess? And there's a weird way to describe it. I can't think of the exact way to describe it properly. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'll have to look into some of their other stuff because, as I say, I've never listened to anything else they've done before. So yeah, I recommend them a lot. So. Mm. I have to say, that it was a. I was actually expecting something a bit heavier from a band called Warpaint. <laughs> yeah, but again, band names can be misleading, I guess. Yeah. I mean, you you hear the name Warpaint. I, I was expecting sort of something in the vein of, um, say, oh, uh, Godsmack, something like that. But it's totally not that. <laughs> Quite categorically so. Mm? I'd probably give it a good 4.5, point a 4 out of 5, maybe, I don't know. Yeah, I'd give it 4 out of 5. It's good, and it's good to see them still making good stuff. Yeah. Uh, I'll definitely be checking out more of their stuff after I've checked out more of so many other bands things <laughs> well, you know, the kind of bands that have started within the last five or six years or so they're probably one of the most promising bands I've seen around so yeah so they keep releasing good stuff and that's even better mm. so many bands lose their way off like the first or second album yeah. uh, now I realise kind of fucked up a bit with what we were planning to do but whatever well if you cover that one album you're going to cover and I will Disappear temporarily for reasons. Hmm? I'll see you in a bit like a minute. Alright. <laughs> okay, so the next album, Meatloaf, Braver Than We Are. Uh, how to describe this album? Basically, this is. Some of it sounds a bit like it should be from a musical, like Shock Treatment. Uh, for those who don't know what Shock Treatment is, that's the semi-sequel in a, as far as it's got some of the same characters um, to Rocky Horror. Uh, it's got Brad and Janet and the Inspector. That's about it. Doesn't even have Tim Curry in any capacity and um, Richard O'Brien is a completely different character as, as is... Um, can't even remember her name, but their names, but the people who played Magenta and Columbia, they're different characters. But anyway, like two of the tracks feel like they should be from Shock Treatment, and it's sort of like, a, okay, is this a musical album? I mean, I've got no problem with that. I mean, one of my favourite albums is framed as a musical, but that's a bit of a surprise, but okay. I hate musicals. <laughs> Okay, Herman. <laughs> um, this is a really strong album, with the exception of one song. Uh, it's enjoyable, but the problem with this song, it's called Speaking in Tongues. It's kind of unintentionally hilarious, because the lyrics... Uh, <laughs> oh god, the lyrics. Um... Like, the opening lines are, For the mighty oak to grow, you got to pl plant a tiny seed. Words are all you know. Body language is what you need. <laughs> uh, okay, then. You can't breathe. Your fragrance fills my lungs. It's time we started speaking in tongues. Speaking in tongues. But here's where it gets really funny. It's that time to start a fire, and I know we'll make it good. We're overflowing with desire. You got the spark, I've got wood. <laughs> it's one of those, um, ah, uh, was that deliberate, or? Honestly, from what I know, it would not surprise me. I mean, the, the, the thing, and a refrain in the song is, an erection of the heart. <laughs> now, on its own, that that's a bit of a questionable line. It's sort of like, okay, I, I guess you're trying to lift up the heart. 
but with the framing of the other lines, it's sort of like, um, maybe should have rethought that line. And what makes it really exceptionally funny is it's done in this really, um, the music would be fitting for, like, Heaven Can Wait. You know, that sort of song. So, it's one of those, um, uh, uh, okay, you might have wanted to rethink this. Uh, that's really the only detractor from the album, because it's one of those, um, I'm not sure if you intended for this to be as hilarious as it is. But hey, maybe you, they will tell us at some point, or we can find out. Mm. Um, it's actually quite interesting that um, I, you've got songs like Souvenirs, which that's really good if you're going through a shitty romantic situation, because the way it's framed is basically, Meatloaf is done. He's completely done with bullshit in a particular romantic situation. And he's just sort of like, you know what, pack your bags, leave. That's, that's the whole driving force behind Souvenirs. It's just a, you know, you've got what you came for, now leave. Um, the track that really stands out, the tracks that really stand out for me, you've got more, which is a Sisters of Mercy cover, which... Now, when I was listening to it, I was sort of like, I know that chorus. Why do I know that chorus? And then I looked it up and it's sort of like, Meatloaf covering Sisters of Mercy? Holy shit! <laughs> and it sounds like if Nick Cave and Vast did a collaboration. Now, those who don't know Vast, uh, they're sort of electronica rock. Well, they're more like... The easiest way to describe them is experimental rock. It's actually one of the few times where I will actually accept the term alternative rock because there's no way you can pin down what their genre is, even on singular albums. But they do have a signature sound. I love Fast. They're one of my top ten bands. So... I could say all the love in the world for them is extremely vast. Uh... <laughs> I can't comment on the album, this album, because I haven't heard it, therefore I have to just, just stay back and make puns. Well, that's a doubly terrible pun, because the name VAST is an acronym for Visual Audio Sensory Theatre. It doesn't make the joke any less effective. Yeah. But anyway, I love VAST, I love Nick Cave. Pretty much, the only way you could actually make this cover of more better is if you had Devin Townsend doing guitar work. And Akira Yamioka doing a few refrains. Well, that's something I can always get behind. Um, the other one, Gods, spelt with a Z, which I hate, but whatever. <laughs> it feels, again, it feels like it would be effective in a film like Shock Treatment or a similarly themed musical, uh, because it's singing about, it's sort of, it's kind of the typical detachment from deities and how they preside over everything. Overall, I would give this album a 4.5 out of 5. The only reason it's not a 5 out of 5 is because speaking in tongues is just so hilariously bad. It is actually a bad song, don't get me wrong. It's just, it's so bad, it's good kind of territory. The problem is, when something gets so damn bad it reverts back to being good, then surely that should make it like a 6 out of 5. No, I, the scores I give are my unironic opinions. In terms of entertainment value, it's definitely a 5 out of 5, but in terms of actual quality, it's a 4.5 out of 5. It's why the Beaker album is a 0.5 out of 5, because in terms of quality, it's horrendous. But none the more for that. Good, more like. No, it is empirically, objectively bad. Your taste is terrible, Pierce. No joke there, I'm just... It's not often I actually say that, but this is one of the few times I will. One more. Anyway, moving on, 
um, because there's not much you can really discuss when... We've got to discuss something when only one person's heard it. Yeah. Um, so next, Nick Cave with Skeleton Tree. I the love this, this album. album. This album is heavy, and it's kind of... It's the heavy that I've needed for quite a while. Um, just... Have you ever, you know, just looked at something and just thought, well, this an object has a better life than I do? That's kind of what this album's like. Yeah. <laughs> well, Nick Cave is quite often, you know, thematically heavy, but this seems more so than usual, even. Yeah. And it's so effective because, like, how it opens, it's... it's very strange it's not really a song it's more of a it's more of a poem set to music with occasional singing inflections if that makes sense hmm it's got a kind of very unsettling kind of pulsing background sound as well yeah it's got this solo creeping manner combined with layered styles of synthesizer which makes it very chilling and you, you're sort of, it's kind of frightening to a certain extent, but it's also very enthralling. Mm. I mean, just just note actually that the album cover, unlike usual for his stuff, is just black with a title. That's it. It's like, this is the void. This is what you're going to listen to. Oh, great. We've got another band that do a fucking black album. I mean, unlike Black Album, it does actually have, you know, Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds, Skeleton Tree written on it, but it was more than Metallica ever did. That had a snake. A black snake on a black background. <laughs> it's like, how more black can this get? And the answer is none. None well, more black. Just replace, you know, the vocalist with someone like, I don't know, Mingo from Emperor or something. They'd be more black. <laughs> I... <laughs> Dude! <laughs> what? Just, I, I want to hear an album that just covers the entirety of the black album in black metal style. I guess. Are you saying you wouldn't want to hear that? I'm not that big into black metal, actually, so... <laughs> I'm not hugely into black metal, but it's still an interesting thing to hear. I mean, you've already heard the entirety, well, a lot of Metallica stuff covered by Apocalyptica with cellos, so why not do it with black metal? I guess. But, anyway... It'd be an interesting experiment, at least. We're getting sidetracked again. Um, but yeah, um, I'm actually unsure what song I'd say is my favourite on here. Um, I mean, play... probably say Anthracene, as soon as I need to pronounce it. Uh, yeah, it would be Anthracene, um, which is quite intriguing because, well, it's a corruption of Anthropocene, which is, um, if I remember correctly, it's basically, uh, well, I'm just going to look it up because the Anthropocene is a proposed epoch that begins when human activities started to have a significant global impact on Earth's geology and ecosystems. So it's a slight corruption of that concept, which is presented in the lyrics. It's discussing... It's this jazz-infused outlook on societal conventions and the habits of how people collapse under the weight of their own mindset, as well as the affectations of external powers that we are unwilling to resist. You know, political, ecological, societal pressures weighing down on us and... So often, we are unable to push back. Um, it's kind of kind of funny that it presents that concept when you consider, at least for me, Girl in Amber, which is a couple of songs earlier, actually feels like a spiritual successor to Push the Sky Away, uh, the specific <laughs> song. Yeah. Girl in Amber is a possible contender for favourite song as well. Yeah. It's very kind of minimalist, distorted, with just piano occasionally coming in now and then, with his vocals just being... just. Jones didn't suffer, I guess, actually. <laughs> he does not sound like a happy person. <laughs> yeah. Even, even more so than usual. Yeah. I think this is part of the reason why I would rearrange the song slightly. Um, I would have actually put Distant Sky as the last song and Skeleton, skeleton Tree after Anthracene. That could work. You know, shuffle around. Because, but... for me, Distant Sky feels like it should be the ending song. Because it feels a bit like a Death Mask song. Kind of like how Internal Landscapes on Weather Systems is. Hmm. It kind of makes me think of, I don't know, at least vocally, kind of like Lazarus by David Bowie as well. Yeah, I can hear that. <laughs> um, which, again, is not a happy album or song. <laughs> it really isn't. Of course, now that we know what was going on at the what? time, it's understandable that it wasn't happy. 
Um, but yeah, I mean, Nick Cave manages to do with certain concepts what I have not heard any other artist manage. Like, with I Need You, that could have easily been just a simple, solemn plea for the love of another. But instead, we get an aching wish to have someone who feels... Um, someone who feels simultaneously as close as can be and yet as infinitely distant as possible as a consequence of an unknowable and uncertain future even the prospect of lasting future it, this is why I'd rearrange Skeleton Tree to be after Anthracene and have I Need You and Distant Sky to be the last two tracks because it feels like that is a capstone for the album coming to a bitter end. <laughs> yeah, just safe to say that if you're feeling down, then this may or may not be the best thing to just do, depending on how you keep with this kind of thing. Well, I mean, Distant Sky, it feels like Nick Cave is finally letting go of all the pain and weight that has overshadowed him over the course of the album. It feels like he's finally going... I'm free of all the pressures that have been weighing down on me, that have been pulling me apart. I'm free of it all. I can finally rest. Please don't die, Nick Cave, we need you! <laughs> yeah, basically that's saying, if you haven't seen him live, go see him. That includes you, Ed. Yeah. <laughs> Please, it's really worth doing. He is a fantastic stage presence. Well, maybe if he was touring in London, I would go see him. What's up with Glastonbury? So that kind of helps. Um, That's right there in front. A total score for this album, I'd give it a 4.8 out of 5. It would be a 5 out of 5 if um, Skeleton Tree was rearranged, but otherwise, amazing album that I think everyone should listen to, even if just once. You may not want to listen to it again afterwards, or you may not want to listen to anything else afterwards. Hmm. <laughs> I was a comment about this album a while ago saying, it was the first part of this album I've never been able to listen to anything else because nothing else sounds the same. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but I'd probably say 4.8, maybe 4.9. 4.98? It's very difficult because it's sort of like that one change and it would either be a 5 out of 5 or even a 6 out of 5. Well, I'm just putting it pretty much a 5. Yeah, it's just... It's one of those, I can't quite manage it because of that slight niggling thing. But anyway, um, amazing album. I will be going back to this. The only reason I haven't listened to it since is because I've been listening to everything else. <laughs> yeah, it's probably the same kind of thing to me. Hmm. I listened to it when it came out and I just had not got around to listening to it again. I did it a little bit before we started doing this, but I did get a proper listen again. Yeah. It deserves it. Um, so that wraps up the rock section. If you want to bleed, just bleed. And if you want to bleed, just bleed. And if you want to bleed,